everybody? Are we all ready to get started? As you know, <clears throat> we gather this morning to celebrate the life of Monty Pendergraf. What a blessing and a joy he is and has been uh, to each of us here. So let's open this time of, of worship and celebration for our brother who is now home with the Lord with a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, how we praise you and we thank you for the gift that Monty was to each of us. Lord, as much as these tragic losses oftentimes fill us with a great range of emotions from sorrow, Lord, to anger, to fear. We pray that in this time that we could truly do honor to Monty's great memory, to his incredible love of you, to his kindness and care of others. Lord, please be glorified most of all in this service for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the empowering force behind all the goodness that we knew in Monty as he constantly pointed us towards Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, start by singing How Great Thou Art. I need to run over to the copy room just real quick. I left something behind. <clears throat> All right. Would you stand and sing? Can you make out the words? If you can't, we've got uh, hymnals right behind you. All right. Here we go. Oh, Lord, my God, when I wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. <clears throat> can't sing. My throat has uh, betrayed me. So April's going to le help lead us in singing as we go into the second verse. All right, here we go. Ready, go. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from my
seated. Now is the time where we remember Monty Ross Pendergraft. He was born on November 26th, 1978 in Oklahoma City, and he passed into glory just this December 27th, 2021, at 43 years old in Fort Collins, Colorado. He's the eldest son of Robin and Nancy. He was educated in elementary schools across New Mexico, or in New Mexico, as well as Texas, and junior high and high school. He was in Florida. He was survived by his daughter, Callie Ann Pendergraft, his parents, older sister Dana, and three younger brothers, David, Michael, and Jason. As we will discuss in a moment, he was an accomplished portrait artist. He worked in general construction, primarily in drywall, and worked also in an auto body shops and in auto body shops and was most definitely a believer in Jesus Christ and his person and his saving work. And anyone who was with Monty for but a few minutes learned quickly what a believer in Christ that he was. He was a student of R.B. Theme Jr. at Baraka Church in Houston, Texas, as many of us were edified by that wonderful Bible teaching ministry, and it was that doctrine that truly uh, was exemplified in his life and throughout his, his uh, constant joyous willingness and boldness in sharing the gospel and the love of Christ. Truly, he would cheer, cheerfully share with anybody or whatever he had, truly whatever he had, no matter how little, no matter how much. He would share generally, generously and openly, and particularly the joy in life which he had in Christ. would like to take um, a few moments to pass around the microphone and share a memory, uh, a moment, something special that you were taught by Monty or something that you'll carry into the time. Um, Robin, can we start with you? No one has to share, but... Sissy to say something. She's the one that has a wonderful way of saying it. So for us, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Monty was uh, very generous and mostly with his time, you know, um, and preaching the Lord's word. That's what I remember. Um, and that's in that one time, you know, I wasn't a believer. And uh, God has changed my life around. And now that I look back, you know, I know the things that he was talking about because they didn't make sense at the time because I didn't know. But now that I've read the Bible and have studied it this last year, all those words that he was preaching to me came, al came alive, you know. And, um, and I realized what he was doing. He was trying to say to help me. You know, and, um, you know, he, he loved to uh, preach to the homeless a lot, and he would tell me stories about it. And I never understood it at the time, but um, that was his ministry, the end of his ministry. 
you know, um, that who goes out to the homeless and preaches? You know, not me, you know, and, uh, and we could come into church and uh, there's a lot of people saved in the church, but out on the streets in the homeless areas, there's not, there's a lot of sinners that are deep and broken. And he, he preached the word and, and helped them and told me stories about it. And I always cherish that. And in uh, his time and his, uh, just his love and compassion and to, to do whatever it takes to, to help another person out, when, especially when they're broken and down. And he always found a way to lift people up, you know, in the Lord's name. And, you know, um, I want to start doing things like that the way Monty did. And just, I just love him. I'm going to miss him so much. And he, he always checked up on me all the time and cheered me on and told me how proud he was of me and changing my life around. And I'm just going to miss those, those times, you know? So he's just an amazing, amazing person. And I am super grateful that the time that God has granted to me that I got with him. And I'm sure everybody else, too. Thank you, guys. Monty's strength <coughs> that he found in the Lord was unmatched by anything else. He uh, had a great love for the Lord, and that is what I hope to pass on <coughs> through his love and God's grace. Monty was a good old boy. <laughs> well, good young boy. <laughs> Old, young, whatever. Oldest young guy. <laughs> he was always there for me, I'll tell you what. Man, when I graduated, he wasn't at my graduation, was he? Well, he wasn't at my graduation. He, went, he was in jail, I guess he was. <laughs> but he was sure that he was uh, sitting there with me. He was there with me through the whole time I was in drug court. And he was cheering me on, rooting me on. No matter what he was going through, he was always there rooting me on. <clears throat> um, when I graduated drug court, he was so thrilled. Um, there's been times Monty saved my life so many times, so many times. I, Monty and I both got the battle, the addiction. And this thing is bigger than we are, I'll tell you. And, um, But Monty, there's been, you know, been times where when I was in drug court, you, you know, I was like, you know, I was on the verge of relapse. I was going to relapse. So I was throw my hands up, throw the towel in. And Monty was right, to, right there to tell me, <laughs> to, t to tell me that if I, if I could beat it, if I could put it down right now that I had this thing beat. And I did. I put it down because he told me. Because he told me. I thought about what he said, and I was like, "You're right, man." And I put it down, and I didn't relapse that time. And like or another time, whenever I did relapse, when he wasn't around, and I did relapse, and I was crying my eyes out. Monty came up, gave me, just gave me a big old hug, and just told me that he loved me and that it's gonna be all right. Just. <laughs> He was just always there for me, just a sweet guy, just always helping people, anybody that was hurt or feeling sad or anything. He was right there to, to comfort them and make them feel good and just his yeah, time. What's the greatest thing you can give anybody is your time. That's what that's what Monty gave everybody was his time, you know. But just a, he was just a good old boy. And everybody said, oh, you, do you know my brother? You know my brother? And, oh, I don't know. I don't think I know your brother. I said, well, you'll know Monty. You can see 
I said, well, you just a good old boy. <laughs> somebody said, somebody, no, so the reason I'm saying he's a good old boy is because somebody else told me that. So, oh, yeah, I know your brother, man. Yeah, he's a good old boy, man. He's a good old boy. So, anyways, but yeah, Monty was my best friend. And. Long road to recovery, but Monty, Monty was just, I don't know, he was always there for me. He was always there for everybody. He was always jumping at the opportunity to do something nice for somebody, open the door for him, be a gentleman to a lady. And just he was just a he was just my best buddy, man. I just I just wish I had the heart that he does. He hated any 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 kind of when I'd get upset or anything, or I'd say something mean to somebody or something like that, or about somebody, he was always right there. David, he was always, you know, bring me back and like. He hated anything gross talk or anything like that. He didn't like any of that stuff. He didn't like cussing. He didn't like. No, any kind of. He hated pornography, anything like that. You know, just. When he's in his right mind, he's just a just a good old boy. You know. And I just wish I was more like my brother Monty, and and he could just sit there. And him, I, I wish I had the gift that he had, which which was sitting there and being able to put up with me, <laughs> put up with me, whining and crying and complaining about it and just whatever, and just sit there and just feel as calm, cool, and collective as as <laughs> as dad. <laughs> And just sit there, and I, I'd be like, "Money, what, what, can you do something, dude?" <laughs> and I couldn't. Pu I'd try to push his buttons, and it would never work. I'd always try to push his buttons, and uh, it would never work with him. And then, but we we loved each other. He loved me. I loved him. I know that. And you know, we had a butt in our heads. We were so close, and we argued all the time. A lot of the time, we we argued and. So we get around, you know, like brothers and sisters do, get around for each other as long as we can stand each other. <laughs> and it wasn't ever, it wasn't ever a case of me not standing Monty. It was a case of Monty needing a break from me. Like, uh, y'all know the way I act, like a two-year-old. <laughs> but I don't know. I just, I could say all good things about Monty, just all the, th the many, many things that he's done for people and, and just donated his time and, his heart to just spill out his heart to to somebody he didn't even know and just to and to try to help them to try to help them that's why he would pour out he'd say anything what do you want to know you know what any way I can help you he 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 do that he would go out of his way so anyways yeah Monty's my best friend and Callie you are so beautiful <laughs> you're so beautiful. Thank you, David. That was very meaningful. Well, he, can, he was definitely a hard worker when he worked and perfectionate. Some of the work he did, the drywall stuff and the carpentry stuff he did, magnificent, really good work. He was dedicated to what he, whatever he did. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, he did. You know, like, my dad struggled for a very long time. Um, as long as I've been alive, I've, I, my dad has struggled. Um, we we were never very close, you know. I grew up not in this like I grew up in a situation where I couldn't see him or really my own mother um, very much. And but when I was in foster care for a very long time, he always made sure that. He could do whatever he could to come see me and um, be there for me in the ways that he could. You know, I never expected much from him because from a very young age, I knew what addiction was and I knew how hard it was. Um, I just wish that, like, 
I wish that I was had gotten old enough to where I could help him because he I wish I could have more time with him. <laughs> um I don't know, yeah, I just wish I I was able to have more time with him. I've always like dreamt of like being able to grow up and to help him because I knew that he couldn't do it on his own. And I only say that because it's obvious he couldn't do it on his own. And he had people that loved him very much, but he didn't have the support I believe he needed to make it out of his addiction. He he deserved so much better than what this world gave him. I wish I could change how his life happened and how it ended, but I know that I can't. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Callie, I think your thoughts on your father were so accurate, powerful, and meaningful. This world is at odds and against anyone who has the light of Christ, the light of love within him. And Monty was a fierce and ferocious warrior for the truth, for the love, for the peace of the gospel. And yet, the trials of this world got to him, as it gets to all of us at times. And it would be wrong for us to view Monty's life as a failure or as something that uh, had gone off the rails at the last moment, because Monty's life is a victory story of the victory of Jesus Christ. Through even the greatest darkness, it could only hold him for so long. It could only hurt him for so long. And as with anyone who knows Jesus Christ, this life of trials and difficulties and challenges and tribulations is but a blip, a speck in the sea and ocean of eternity, of eternal life, which we've been one to in Jesus Christ. I'd like for us to take a moment and read some scriptures that I prayed about the message of Monty's life, these scriptures came to mind. The first is John chapter 10, verses 7 through 18. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not his own, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees causes, uh, because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me. Because I lay down my life. That I might take it up again. 
No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I received from my Father. 27 through 30 continues, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Because Jesus is our good shepherd, we can pray Psalm 23 right alongside our brother David. Not this David, King David. I mean, David will be a king one day soon too, but you know which one I'm talking about. King David in the Bible. What? <laughs> the one you're in, that's right. David the first. You could be David the second. <clears throat> Don't tell Dave Roslin. All right. <laughs> if you've got your, uh, your Bible open right now, feel free to pray this along with me or read this along with me. I know our translations might not match up, but I'm in the New King James. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. For our message today, I'm most inspired, and we'll come back around to this, but by Monty's incredible artistic gift. Because it's such a thorough expression of what he is, this, uh, for those of you who don't know, Monty drew this piece, this beautiful piece of art, this beautiful picture of the Lord. He called it the Good Shepherd. It sits on my desk. I received it in the mail. I don't know where Monty mailed it from. But on the day that I got it, I cried for a full half an hour for joy to see the Savior through Monty's eyes. It was such a precious treat, such a precious gift. So when I think of Monty, I think of Luke chapter 15. For those of you who are familiar with this chapter, in it, the Lord tells three powerful parables. The parable of a lost sheep, to which we'll return. The parable of a lost coin. And the parable of a lost son. But in each of these par parables, we oftentimes miss the point of Jesus in telling them. We focus on the sheep, the coin, and the son. But the focus is not upon the sheep, the coin, or the son. The focus is on the shepherd, on the woman who lost the coin, and on the father whose son left him. Jesus didn't tell these tales to show us how to go wrong. He told these tales to show us the heart of God who rejoices over anyone who will return to Him. So we'll start at verse 11. It says, And a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. 
There's a lot culturally packed into this that we can't understand. We can kind of understand what it would be like if a child walked up to their father and said, I wish you were dead. Just give me the money now, you worthless old man. Just give me the cash that I would get and let's sever ties forever. I'll live as if you're dead. You live as if I'm dead. And that sounds pretty harsh. But we, what we don't understand culturally is that in this honor-shame culture, in the culture in which the, first, the New Testament was written, it was more than that. You see, not only would it be the hurt and the wounding and the betrayal that the son showed the father, but it also would be a public shame for him. It would be difficult for the father ever to show his face in public again, because by all rights, what he could do according to the law of Moses and was commanded to do according to the law of Moses was to have that boy executed. That was the legal response. That was the expected cultural response. And yet, this father allowed his son, his foolhardy son, to shame him in such a deep and profound way that neither of them would ever be the same. This is so critical that we understand how deep this wound would have been, how impossible it would seem from anyone inside or out for the son and the father to ever reconcile. This was a permanent final betrayal by any cultural context. These were never speak again words. The relationship was broken seemingly forever. We find that the son goes off and takes all of the father's hard-earned cash, probably the result of generations upon generations of responsible stewardship and care, and he wastes it, we're told, in prodigal living. We can leave to our imagination what that would be, but we can be assured it involved wine, women, and song, and involved uh, spending the money to make false friends, to impress people. But verse 14 continues, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in all that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his st stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one else gave anything. For a Jewish person, granted, he's definitely an apostate Jewish person, uh, pigs were an unclean animal. So to be caused to serve the pigs was a sign of being utterly destitute, hopeless. The wonderful euphemism pods that he longed to fill his stomach were the refuse, both animal refuse and other refuse that were being fed to the pigs. And as is well pointed out by Eric Clapton, nobody knows you when you're down and out. He'd come to the bottom of the barrel. He'd hit rock bottom hopeless and helpless when something occurs to him. He says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The son's become finally so desperate that he's willing to ask for mercy, to admit that he's wrong. So he starts rehearsing his speech. Lord, I know I'm not worthy. I know I can only hope by your grace to be a servant, a slave in your house. And this is exactly what everyone does. When we hit rock bottom and we're finally ready to turn to God, we say, God, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to do better. I know I'm not worthy. I know I blew it. But I'm going to try so much harder. I'm going to try so much harder this time. So he arms himself with that argument like we often do. It says he arose and came to his father. But notice this. When he was still a way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck 
and kissed him. This tells us a couple interesting things about the father. First of all, the fact that he saw him a ways off. You'd think that if you or I are in that position, we'd say, good riddance, I never want to see that son again. But what this tells us is that the father was every day waking to scan the horizon, hoping that today, that this time, he would see his son walk over it. He would see his son again. He was hoping to see the son who betrayed him, who squandered his wealth, who stole from him, who harmed him so deeply, socially, personally, publicly, humiliated him, and he scanned the horizon longing to see, see him. We're told he has compassion. He didn't look upon his son's failures and follies. He suffered with him knowing that we all struggle in such ways. And then the real shock. You see, in first century Jewish culture, one would never run if one was an honorable man. Part of being a grown-up was taking good, measured, placid steps, showing that you were wise and you were in control. But when he saw his son, this father hiked up his robes like a kid and ran his bare legs in the wind, ran towards the shape of his son, and fell on his neck and showered him with kisses. And the son tries to get out his, his weak little argument, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, completely ignoring the ridiculous half-baked offer of the son. It says, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The father does what's absolutely unexpected. It would be nice of him to say, yes, of course you can be a slave in my house. You'll get fed, you'll get clothed, you'll be better off than you were. But that's not even a thought in the father's mind. Putting a robe on him is an idea of identification and protection. He's placing him back immediately amongst society. Putting a ring on his finger was an acceptance back into the family that even though he had squandered his entire inheritance, that he would have a place amongst the family and his position in the family was secured. Sandals on his feet, again, a sign that he was a part of and included in what he cared for and protected forevermore. We're told in the next account, which will saved for time, about the older son. And the older son was jealous. When his father explained the banquet, he says, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fattened calf for him. You see, the father and his limitless love and his desire to forgive and bring back and restore and rebuild lost and broken souls is a picture of God. And we are pictured as one of two people. We are either the self-righteous self-concerned older son who says, I better, I did better. Why couldn't everyone else do as good as me? Why couldn't everybody else be as good as I am? What's wrong with them? How could they be so? How could they be so? How could they be so? And that son has no fellowship with the father. Or you could be like that younger son 
who recognizes all that we've done in violation of God's perfection, who recognizes that while we all might be able to grade out according to this world's standards, we truly stand shoulder to shoulder, mired in our sin and our need and our hopelessness. And the only hope that we have that's available to us is found in the love of the Father as expressed through Jesus Christ the Son. Monty was the younger son. Monty knew his limitations. He knew how great his need. He felt the pain of the sin that persecuted him and that chased him throughout his life. But he had taken hold of the hand of the Lord of love. He had rushed back into the arms of the Father. He was forgiven every sin. He was restored and complete. And now he walks every moment since that tragic night in 100% wholeness and completeness. Never to fear, feel pain or fear or sorrow again. Not because Monty was so wonderful, though he was, but because Jesus Christ is so wonderful. As I said... <clears throat> Monty well, drew this beautiful portrait. Makes me think of Luke 15, 1 through 7. He says, What a man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one who is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Oh dear. My apologies. It was Philip Yancey that pointed out the terrible the terrible math of the gospel of grace. You have a hundred sheep, you have ninety nine of them. And you're going to leave them all vulnerable just to save the one? Now look at Monty's picture. Look at how the Savior, how his face has no anger, no bitterness, no frustration for the time lost or the price paid. He doesn't think towards punishment but simple, gentle kindness and love that his little lamb is safe. See how the sad, helpless lamb looks up to the shepherd, no longer in danger, no longer lost, alone, or afraid. Don't you see Monty's gaze at his Savior? I hope you can see it there as we look at this beautiful, beautiful piece of art which he made. I hope you know that Jesus pursues you with that same love. And just as he never let Monty go, he will never let you go. If you trust in him, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, to forgive you and rose again on the third day. You're his sheep, safe in his arms. And you'll see Monty again, knowing the Lord that he loved.
seeing the life that he lived. The imperfect, flawed, but in total glory of the Christ who came to die and save us all. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll sing our closing hymn. Father, now we thank you. For your love, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who rather than see us lost and apart from you for all eternity, came to earth and paid the ultimate sacrifice, the living letter of love, such that there is nothing that stands between us and you. And as Monty ran towards you and knew your love. Might we do so too? Might we know that ferocious and gracious love that though Monty was tortured and hurt by addiction and by the deceptions of this world, that it never impeded his ability to show your love to others. How perfect a picture in all our brokenness. Please be glorified, Lord, in our lives as we're inspired by the Lord love which you gave us through Monty's life. Lord, please be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. April will now lead us in. What a friend we have in Jesus. Well, 
from this service, I think one thing is clear. Monty is an object, a very trophy of God's amazing grace. I want to give you just a short time to meditate on and think on and pray if needs be. Maybe this is the moment that you make your choice to trust in Jesus Christ. Any thoughts, way of things you need to forgive and let go and move on from so that you can live as Monty would undoubtedly have you live, whole and full and basking in the love of your Savior and the amazing grace he's given. So we'll play through amazing grace three times. I'll just give you that opportunity to think on that, the message of Monty's life. Thank you for joining us for this celebration of a most wonderful life. We close with me in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, this life is short and so often filled with sorrows. There's so little that we understand from our limited human viewpoint. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fellowship of your body. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, who took a poor sinner like Monty who saved him, forgave him, empowered him to live through all adversity a remarkable life that was branded by the powerful love which you gave us in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. 
Oh, Lord, as you worked in Monty, so work in us. Make us all such bold and courageous instruments and mouthpieces of your gospel and love. Might we always remember that we sit in the place of that younger brother, desperately in need of your love and grace, and desiring in all humility and love to share it with others. Might we bask in it as Monty basks in the glorious love of yours now as he stepped into and enjoys his reward, his inheritance, his position at the right hand of the Father. We look forward to serving with Monty again in your kingdom to come. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.